Act one. D-U-Y. <laughs> so this guy committed a crime and it had huge consequences for this first person we're bringing out, Mike Berbiglia. And, uh, and then the best way to describe what happened is Mike found he could not leave the scene of the crime. Please welcome Mike Berbiglia. <laughs> Two years ago, I'm in Los Angeles, and I'm at my friend Andy's house, and we're watching TV. And Earlier in the night, I'd gotten in a fight with my girlfriend, Jenny. You ever get in a fight with your girlfriend that's so bad that afterwards you don't know where you are or what year it is? I was just like, let's just watch Bagger Vance. She had been at the uh, wedding of one of her friends, and she was annoyed because people she hardly knew kept asking about our status as a couple. So annoyed that she called me to ask about our status as a couple. And I, this is problematic because I'd always been against the idea of marriage. I, I decided I wasn't going to get married until I was sure that nothing else good could happen in my life. <laughs> Basically, I didn't see the upside of there being one person you're assigned to and, and who's assigned to you. Because I, I never looked at my parents' marriage or really anyone who had been married 30 years and thought, I got to get me some of that. <laughs> well, this is something that Andy and I had rallied behind together. And we knew we were right. This is important for me to point out uh, that sometimes when I think that I'm right, it can be a real source of contention between me and people who I'm close to. And the reason it's a source of contention is that I'm right. <laughs> so not only did Andy and I not believe in marriage for ourselves, but we made it our mission to discourage other people from getting married, and people we cared about most. Andy and I stopped or put on hold four to seven marriages. We were, we were pretty good. Uh, we weren't amazing, but we were solid. I'm at Andy's house, and it's 1 AM, and I get into my rental car, and I head back to my hotel. And I make a right turn out of Andy Street, and I am T-boned. That's the culinary way of describing it. I, uh, <laughs> It means that I am, I am hit uh, driver's side at a 90 degree angle, like a T-bone steak. Uh, and it was by a drunk driver who probably would have enjoyed that. And um, <laughs> being hit by a car is uh, hard to describe. I'm sure some of you have experienced this. But you know those water slides where you lie on your back and then you fall at a vertical angle? at like a thousand miles an hour. Um, it's like if you went on one of those, but no one told you you were going on the slide. It, <laughs> it's like if you were taking a shower, and then you're on that slide. <laughs> so in, in one and a half seconds, my car spins around 180 degrees, and I hear nothing, and I think I'm dead, no weight. I'm paralyzed, and then I, I hear nothing, and then I hear the other car skid out and drive away. And I have that Eli Wiesel moment where I think, human beings are animals. <laughs> I think that's how he said it. And uh, 20 minutes later, I'm sitting on the curb. Andy has shown up, as well as the police and the paramedics, and that's when I start crying. You know how when you drop a baby on the ground, it, it doesn't start crying right away because it, it doesn't understand the concept of dropping a baby on the ground until it sees your face? And then it's like, oh, I, I guess I should be crying or something. And, and I'm crying because I'm looking at my totaled car and it hits me that in that moment I might have ceased to exist. A police officer walks over to me and he says, what happened? And I say, 
I was hit by this car and then I heard nothing and then I heard it skid out and drive away and he says, well, he didn't get too far and he points to the intersection 100 yards away and the, and the other car has made a right turn and driven into a small tree. And I can't help but think, that is karma, bitch. <laughs> that is a hit and run and a hit. I'm on the curb and the cop asked me to sign a piece of paper and I say, what's it for? And he says, it's a statement saying you're okay and that we can leave. <laughs> and I say, I, I don't know if I'm okay. And he says, just sign it. <laughs> and I said, no, I, I, I actually, I'm a little shaken up. And he says, just sign it. And he holds it in my face and it occurs to me that he's not going to move. And so I sign it. And Andy drives me uh, to the hospital just as a precaution. And uh, the doctor, we have to wait an hour because the doctor is treating the drunk guy. He beat us there. And, um, <laughs> eventually, we're with the doctor. And he apologizes for the wait. And, and Andy says, was the other guy drunk? And the doctor says, well, I, I can't answer that. And Andy says, was he? He uses the tactic we had learned earlier from the cop. <laughs> and it works. <laughs> the doctor says, well, he's heading to jail now. And Andy and I flash each other a look like the Hardy Boys. <laughs> Case closed. <laughs> Andy and I get back to the house at 4 or 5 o'clock, and I have one of those cliche revelations a lot of people have when they have near-death experiences. I'm like, I think I have to call Jenny and, and tell her that we need to get married. And Andy says, sleep on it. <laughs> and I say, no, 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 I figured it out. I mean, this all makes sense. I, I need to call her right now. And he says, Mike, sleep on it. <laughs> he saves me. And the next morning, I fly back to New York, and I, I get a call uh, on my voicemail from the rental car agency telling me that the accident report found me at fault, and I owe $12,000 for the repairs on the other guy's Mercedes SUV. And I call back right away, and I explain that this is a mistake, and the woman says, Unless they change the accident report, you owe $12,000. And so I, I start freaking out, and I, I'm, I, I'm like, I need to fix this. I, I get the accident report, and it's a mess. You know, I can see why there's a misunderstanding. An accident report is kind of like a homework for cops. <laughs> and Officer Timson, not so good with the homework. Uh, <laughs> It, the report mixes up vehicle one and vehicle two, driver one and driver two. I actually want to show you this. This is the actual report. And um, it mixes it up so badly that um, it, it says um, a P1, that's me, started to go. But all of a sudden, V1, that's also me. <laughs> came at a high rate of speed crashing into him. They're saying I crashed into my own car. I mean, I'm pretty self-destructive, but I would never crash into my own car with my own car, nor would I understand how to do that. I also love this. This is the statement of the other driver at the scene of the crime. I was going on Venice, uh, I'm not too sure. I was going away from the beach. I was driving. I don't know what happened. Did I hurt anyone? I don't know where I was going, but I came from home. I had a sip of beer. <laughs> Which is really everyone's favorite quantity of beer, is the sip. That's what they serve at the pubs these days. A, a pint, a pitcher, a sip, a tablespoon. 
People are like always like, oh man, I had a sip of beer. I don't know where I'm driving from or where I'm driving to. <laughs> well, the problem is that even with all that, Officer Timpson made one key mistake. He checked the box that said that I was at fault. So I called the police station to get the captain on the phone, and he ducks my calls for days, and I, I can't get in touch with him, and then finally I get him on the phone. And I'm so relieved, I'm like, I explained that I was wronged, I was nearly killed, and I tell him the whole story, and he says, you made a bad turn, now do the right thing and pay for the guy's car. I know. <laughs> and I, I explain, you know, like, I, you know, I, this is just a, an easy thing to fix, it's just a mix-up, and he's not hearing any of it. And, and finally, I'm, I'm like, Please, I mean, can we just discuss this uh, for a second, like just as people, just as like one human being to another? At this point, I'd become Adam Sandler in one of his more sentimental films. I, I, I was like, can you see how crazy this is? You know, that I, this guy who's drunk crashed into my car. He nearly killed me. I mean, inches from where he hit, I, I'd be dead. And you're saying that my parents would have had to pay for, for his car. And he says, do the right thing and pay for the guy's car. And I hang up the phone, and this is when it becomes about principle. This isn't about money. This is about stopping a man who has no regard for people or the law. This is Chinatown. I, I start uh, printing out Google Maps of the scene of the accident and California state driving laws. I pour over the police report circling inconsistencies and scrawling notes in the margins like, are you kidding me? And this makes no sense. And what is this blacked out part? There was a blacked out part next to his blood alcohol level. And I'm calling lawyers and private investigators. There's only one lawyer who will even consider my case. He's an accident lawyer. And he, he says, uh, did you have any loss of income? from the accident. I said, no. And he says, did you have any loss of income <laughs> from the accident? And I said, no, this isn't about money. And it gets very quiet. <laughs> and I said, I shouldn't have to lie. I'm right. And he doesn't take the case. And this is when I start going crazy. <laughs> I start obsessing over the actual driver. I'm like, who is this man who nearly kills me and wants my $12,000? I know his name. It's Jim Bosworth. That's not his name. But I, I, I do know his name. And I register for an online account at netdetective.com, which is a, a great site for vigilantes who have $29.95. And I... <laughs> So I know where he lives, what he does. My inner monologue becomes like a movie trailer for a revenge thriller, like Jim Bosworth thought he was gonna get away with this. <laughs> but he didn't count on one thing, Mike Birbiglia. <laughs> so I'm, I'm up till three in the morning every night. It's hard when you know that you're right. And I start coming up with these illogical plans, like, I'm gonna quit my job and work on this full time. I'm gonna sue the LAPD, and I will track down Jim Bosworth. It, at this point, people stop talking to me. I mean, my friends would call me, and they'd be like, hey, what's going on? I'd be like, I'll tell you what's going on. They'd, they'd be like, you should get a lawyer, and I snap. I'm like, this is way past lawyers. One night, Jenny and I are out to dinner, and um, I'm, she's talking, but I'm not listening because I'm, I'm writing down ideas I have about the case on my napkin. Um, this is the actual napkin. I don't know if you can see this, but it's a very carefully laid out argument about my situation. And, and she says, why don't you do that in the morning? And I say, this is serious. Which part of this napkin don't you understand? <laughs> she says, I don't know what to tell you, Mike, because you're right, but it's only hurting you, and I, I'm just so glad that you're alive, and I think that we should focus on that. And she only has to say it once. 
and I drop the case and I pay for the guy's car. And a few months later, Jenny and I go to City Hall and get married. I still didn't believe in the idea of marriage and I, I still don't. <laughs> but I believe in her and I've given up on the idea of being right. Mike Rubiglia. Mike Rubiglia's one-man show, Sleepwalk With Me, is playing off-Broadway. This fall, uh, Mike Rubiglia is coming to your town on a 30-city tour.